Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. If you're listening to this in real time, it is the first week of December. The Christmas season is descending upon Memphis, and that means lots of decorations and festivities and parties, all of which are a lot of fun. And uh, last night, we were at a Friendsgiving party. <laughs> A Friendsgiving. That was a new word to me up until a couple of years ago. (laughs) Well, it has been around for a while. I'm pretty sure. But the first time I heard of it was really when the girls started having Friendsgiving parties. I remember back when Lizzie was in high school, she would have them with her friends. Uh, Most of the time they would do this perhaps the day before or after Thanksgiving. All the high school kids would each contribute. They'd cook a meal, or collectively they'd cook a meal. Each would bring a dish, kind of like uh, we were doing as a family. Um, they would cook and eat together with their friends. And then when Anna was in college, uh, her junior year, this was before COVID, she hosted an enormous Friendsgiving, actually bigger than the one we were having here at the house. Over 40 college kids all sat around eating turkey and all this other kind of holiday food before they were going to leave campus and go back to their family uh, back home. I, I probably should post a picture of the her friends giving on Instagram. Anna couldn't get all the crowd of people in a single picture because she had friends spread over her entire house all eating turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, you know, Thanksgiving is a very American thing and uh, indigenous to this uh, hodgepodge, which is the culture in America, which has been pulled from so many other uh, and older cultures from all over the world. Um, As a national holiday, Thanksgiving didn't exist officially until 1863 when Abraham Lincoln proclaimed that a national Thanksgiving Day would be held each November. But the holiday has its roots in the early days when the Europeans first arrived on the American continent, starving and suffering from scurvy. They were helped by indigenous people who taught them how to cultivate corn and other techniques that would enable them to survive in this really a foreign howling wilderness that they landed in. And, um, those original settlers formed an alliance with the Wampanoag tribe that would last over 50 years. And unfortunately, although it is one of the few examples of harmony between Europeans and indigenous peoples of America, it is one example of harmony. And, After the first harvest uh, for those early pilgrims, William Bradford, their governor, invited their new indigenous friends for a festival that would last for three days in which they celebrated together. And the, the official pilgrim chronicler wrote these words, our harvest being gotten in. Our governor sent four men on fowling that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help besides, served the company almost a week. My goodness. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and amongst the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men whom for three days we entertained and feasted. That was a big party. (laughs) Well, yeah. The original Thanksgiving was actually... A friend. Okay. <laughs> Which brings us to this very interesting time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Gary and I are Christians, so as the year comes to a close, we turn our thoughts toward Christmas. Uh, that's a sacred holiday that celebrates Christ. But also, it brings with it an idea of fun. We love it. Lots of decorations and parties and food and music. The idea of peace on earth and good tidings to all people. But of course, Christians are not the only people to seek peace or even celebrate the end of the year with festivities. Uh, All peoples of all nations do this in various ways. And on this American continent uh, and the cultures that existed here long before the pilgrims had their friendsgiving with the Wampanoag people, There was a very influential hero who contributed greatly to bring peace to thousands of indigenous people on this continent and who likely influenced the peacekeeping instrument that still binds Americans together today in the American Constitution. 
In case you haven't figured out who we are talking about or are unfamiliar with his name, uh, today we've decided to take a minute to look at the Iroquois Confederation, the notable creators of the document today that we would call the Iroquois Constitution and their mythical peacemaker, Dakana Witta. Dakana Witta was so revered of a man during his lifetime that most of his fellow tribesmen would not even utter his name. Instead, he was only called the Peacemaker. His story is mythical and has left a strong legacy in the area that today we call upstate New York and lower Canada. You know, now the land of the Iroquois Confederacy, generally speaking, that includes the area to the south of Lake Ontario and to the east of Lake Erie. Uh, Because these people recorded history through oral traditions instead of written ones, the dates are difficult for us to really pinpoint. But, you know, the peacemaker likely dates back to the 12th century. And that, by the way, is much earlier than our English language textbooks really start recording Mm -hmm. things. Obviously, English wasn't spoken by indigenous people. So most English language American textbooks don't have literature that dates back that far. But for most books, we do include a few pieces. And one of the first pieces of literature in most American literature textbooks is this one. Uh, this document of the Iroquois people of that confederation of six tribal nations. The document is called the Iroquois Constitution. I will admit, however, uh, that there is not much, in at least my textbook, by way of explanation and many years, maybe even most years, if I'm honest, I have a tendency to skip over this piece of writing, not because I want to be disrespectful, but because I just don't know enough about it to feel confident in it. Much of the discussion, if you look, you know, online or YouTube or in textbooks uh, about the Iroquois Constitution in regard to American literature, stems around wanting to discuss and debate to what degree the Iroquois Constitution influenced the American Constitution and how much credit should be given from one document to the other. You know, we're very in- interested in citations. In the- <laughs> <laughs> and I never really felt qualified to speak to that, so I just kind of didn't say anything. But today I, I feel that we, uh, maybe I have been wrong in this and I'm remiss in this, and So uh, I'm excited about reading this excerpt of the Iroquois Constitution and talk a little bit about the text itself, explore the symbolism, because that for sure has lasted and made an incredibly significant mark on American culture, and maybe even listen to you give us a little bit of explanation to that ever intriguing question. To what degree does the American Constitution owe a debt to the Iroquois Constitution? <laughs> <laughs> that is a terribly loaded question, and it's not as simple to answer as you might think. Of course not. <laughs> well, as all true history tends to be, oh. it's always complicated. Uh, the Congress of the United States says, yes, we know that for sure. In, in October of 1988, a uh, concurrent resolution passed acknowledging the contribution of the Iroquois Confederacy to the formation and development of the United States. But of course, Congress is not a historical body. It's a political one. Oh, for sure. So that answer is not a historical answer, but a political answer. And historians are not so quick to agree on the answer to this question. Um, History, uh, for those of us who are honest, um, it's complicated and it's messy. And sometimes we can't even really know for sure the details surrounding the creation of anything because sometimes things are so kind of intertangled. And, uh, you know, to illustrate what I mean, you you need to look no further than the very word Iroquois. (laughs) How's that? Who are the Iroquois? Well, uh, they weren't Iroquois, at least not to them. I mean, that is not an indigenous word at all. I mean, the people of uh, Dakanawitta were known and are still known as the Haudenosaunee or the people of the Longhouse. The document you're referring to is called the Geyanishogawa, um, or the Great Law of Peace. And uh, in its entirety, it exists only in the Iroquois oral tradition. And even though it is still maintained and recited to this day, we would probably not 
like to read it on this podcast for the simple reason that it takes several days to recite fully. And uh, it was recorded on wampum belts uh, through wampum symbols that conveyed its meaning. And um, hundreds of years ago, after it was created, it was translated into English. And the English written version was divided into 117 articles. <laughs> that is a lot of reading. Well, yes. And the selection in our textbook is only about a page and a half. So it, it's not the full edition. <laughs> <laughs> True. You know, and and whether or not the Iroquois Constitution influenced the U.S. Constitution, I mean, although it's interesting for my money, it's not the most interesting and it's not the most important reason to read and, and think about it. The Iroquois Confederacy and its constitution is important and distinctive really in its own right as a political document. And this is what I want to highlight. Uh, you know, like we said, the um, Iroquois Constitution predates the advent of Europeans to the American continent, perhaps by several hundred years. But what that means is that uh, the Iroquois can lay claim really to the first constitutional system in this area that today that we would refer to as the United States. And uh, the Confederacy, the five and then six nations, which we are getting ready to discuss, is important and stands alone in its importance for being one of the longest surviving, documented, confederated governments on planet Earth. How's that for a long description? <laughs> and, you know, for those of us interested in history and politics— May not be everybody, but, you know, I am. Uh, that's an incredible distinctive. It's an amazing document for another reason. You know, at the same time in Europe, we're seeing indigenous peoples of Europe formulate similar documents regarding uh, power sharing, starting with the Magna Carta. And um, the indigenous people here in this continent with no connection and they were doing roughly the same thing at roughly the same time. And, you know, one question that historians often discuss is how societies transition from being pre-political societies, really, to the emergence of states as we know them today. And, you know, the Iroquois Confederation provides uh, a documented example of how this transition occurred and may have occurred in similar fashions really all over the planet, almost archetypally. Huh, that is you know, unusual, I guess, or paradoxical, maybe. Of course, the culture of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people is unique and something that I remember actually studying when I was a little girl. I attended this school, Tyak Elementary School at the time, and I was living in Prince George's County, Maryland in the second grade, and, and we talked about them, and I can actually remember it. Really? Before you moved to Brazil, really? What do you remember about that? Well, the main thing I remember, maybe I wouldn't remember anything if it weren't for those long houses. I think we even made some in art class, and if you've never heard of a long house, they were these wooden structures that people lived by extended family kind of partitioned off, and uh, they could be up to 200 feet long. They were partitioned off by family unit, and they were um, segmented by multiple fireplaces where families could gather together. I remember thinking, oh, how fun that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, and this is really an aside, uh, my dad and stepmother, Barbara, have actually slept <laughs> in a longhouse. Well, that's quite a resume point right there. So where was this? And did, did they do it for fun? Oh, no, this isn't like a timeshare or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for fun. They were doing some missionary work for an indigenous people group in Malaysia. And in Malaysia, there are still indigenous people that live communally in longhouses, much like the Iroquois people. Oh, well, that's incredible. Um, it's also interesting that that is one of the things you remember from your <laughs> Early school days. I know. Isn't uh, that crazy? Yeah. Did your teacher back then tell you the Iroquois were matriarchal or run by women? And I I'm pretty sure you, of all people, would have hung on to that bit of trivia. I know. In that culture, when a man married, he left his father's home and joined the longhouse of his wife, which was run by a senior female. I think they concealed that on purpose. I know for sure <laughs> I would purpose. have remembered that. Mm. <laughs> I don't really know. I do remember the images of the longhouses. 
Well, you know, the longhouses of the Iroquois were really under the supervision of the senior matron. And in Iroquois society, the division of labor was also gender-based. Women did most of the farming, and the men, among other things, were responsible for hunting and fighting and conducting relations with other tribes. And this meant that the men were gone for a long period of time from the longhouse. And the social unit really of the Iroquois people was not the nuclear family like we think of it, but really it was the extended family, a grandmother, her daughters, grandchildren, you know, along with spouses living under a very long extended room. And these family groupings were highly organized in the clans and the clans passed down names or or something close to what the Europeans would call actually titles. Um, Although this is somewhat of a simplification, these titles or names are what they called sachems. And we don't have an equivalent of a sachem in the modern American context, but it is an extremely important role in the Iroquois Confederacy. And a sachem was a man specifically selected to represent his people and whose role was not really to help establishing peace among the other Iroquois nations. So is a sachem what we would call an an Indian chief, to use an outdated term? <laughs> it's not the same thing as a chief. Um, although the European settlers really were confused and used that term quite a bit because, uh, for lack of a better alternative. And the sachem is a leadership role of great importance. And maybe you could see it as something like uh, what the British have in the House of Lords. But, you know, since we didn't adopt anything similar in American government, is kind of difficult for us to relate to that. But You know, all that to say, the people of the Longhouse were literally people who lived in longhouses and at the basic level were governed by women. But they took this picture of a longhouse, the physical place where they lived, and they use it to symbolize a confederacy really between peoples who shared uh, a similar language and similar way of life. And this confederacy was united politically through a council of 50 men, the sachems, who were selected by the various nations through different means. And the series of events that led to this organization have been handed down orally and it produced an oral document, you know, documented visually through symbols. Which brings us to the story we're going to tell today, and that's the story of the peacemaker. Of course, oral Tradition holds that the various clans living in this area around Lake Ontario and Lake Erie were engaged in constant warfare. And by everything I've read, it was truly brutal and bloody and ruthless and apparently never ending. Uh, There were various accounts, of course, because it is oral tradition and so different traditions have different details. And I'll pick just one admitting here on the front end that you may see various versions of the story that you're going about that you're about to hear but it comes down to there was a specific woman one time and her mother who were in this warring tribe scenario and they were forced to flee for their lives because they were attacked or their village was attacked by one of these warring groups once they were away to safety the woman realized that she was pregnant, but this made no sense to her because she was still a virgin. She had a dream, and in her dream, a spirit told her the child in her womb had been chosen by the Creator to bring a message of peace to his people. This woman raised her son, and starting in his childhood, the young man taught words of kindness and understanding and love and respect and He called on his people to return to the ways of their creator. The people listened to him, and he became known as the peacemaker. After he grew up, he turned his attention to other peoples who needed to hear the message. He carved a canoe out of white stone. And of course, his mother and grandmother were shocked to see that it could float, and it did float down the river. The peacemaker brought this message of peace, first to the Mohawks and then to the Oneida, then to the Cayuga and the Seneca. But the Seneca were reluctant and they didn't trust him. The peacemaker found two warriors who were willing to support him. One of those warrior helpers today we call Hiawatha. The poet Longfellow, who came along later, borrowed 
uh, Hiawatha's name to write a poem about a different Indian. And he, the other Indian's name was complicated, so he chose Hiawatha. So if you ever hear a poem about Hiawatha, it's not actually about <laughs> The right one, and that's so confusing. But anyway, the real Hiawatha, this other warrior, uh, many think uh, worked with the peacemaker along with a woman, and the three of them uh, would go down uh, the river. In many of the versions of the story, the peacemaker actually had a speech impediment, and Hiawatha became the main preacher, and he would speak the words from the prophet, the peacemaker. In all the versions, at least, that I found, this group of three traveled up and down the shores of Lake Erie and on Lake Ontario and down the St. Lawrence River, and they taught and promoted this vision of peace. Finally, at one point, the group was able to unite a special council on the Onondaga Lake, and representatives from all these nations uh, were gathering uh, to talk about things. One obstacle that they had, though, was this sorcerer, and he confronted them. And this sorcerer lived on the lake, and he inspired fear in lots of people. And he had snakes as hair. He was really evil to the point that he had Hiawatha's three daughters actually killed. Uh, There's a long story that goes along with that. But it comes down to the idea that Hiawatha was able to forgive the sorcerer And this incredible act of forgiveness enabled peace to move forward in a way that hadn't happened before. The peacemaker brought in the sorcerer, actually, and he became a part of the peace process, a central chief in the process, actually. He became uh, a part of the system and actually the council's fire keeper. And this was a very important role because if you remember, we're talking about the longhouse. The longhouse has these fires where people come around and it's a uniting factor. And the longhouse itself was going to be an important symbol of this confederation of nations. So the fire in the longhouse was going to symbolize a way that these people were going to be able to come together. And it was a a very important feature of the culture. So the sorcerer who had been an enemy now is becoming a keeper of the fire. And he also became the keeper of the wampoon, which is the string of beads where the constitution eventually would be recorded. So with 11 representatives in place at the grand council, the peacemaker created the laws of the great peace. And after this was created, at some point, the Seneca people joined the council, completing the Confederacy. The original Confederacy was formed of these five nations, and 50 sachems would sit as members of the council and would meet at the Onondaga, which was at the center of the Confederacy. In order to symbolize the peace, the peacemaker chose a white pine tree. And all the members buried their weapons under this tree, agreeing to never use them again against each other. And on top of the tree was an eagle that would act as a guardian to the peace. Hmm. The idea was the nations were now going to be a single longhouse. Exactly. So if you look at a map, you can see the nations aligned vertically really just that way with the uh, the Seneca to the west and the Mohawk nation uh, on the far east. And the Mohawks would be the eastern door of the Confederacy and the Seneca would be the keepers of the west. And they were now the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Longhouse, the Longhouse being the metaphor for this new nation. The laws governing the Confederacy were complex, and they were highly sophisticated, and the Mohawks were the first among equals, the you know, the preeminent tribe. You have to remember, uh, really, that the individual people groups were not equal in size or strength, so negotiations were not simplistic. And we also have to remember that the Confederacy was designed to keep peace between the nations, not within 
the different nations. And they weren't interested in building a nation state like we would think of today. And each nation governed itself separately. And the council was not telling families how to interact with each other or within the individual nations. So we are talking about a confederacy. This is not a democracy like we would think of today with, you know, one person, one vote, that sort of thing. But the Confederacy held together for centuries, and actually it's still in place today. And and to this day, representatives um, of the whole Confederacy still meet. They still gather around a single council fire, and they discuss issues that affect the nations. And um, you know what? Let's read the beginning words. It's kind of a famous introduction. You have to remember that this is a translation. So as with all poetry that is translated— it's going to sound slightly stilted and not as natural as if we were able to understand the original words in its original context. So, so Christy, let's uh, read Decano Wood's words about the tree of the great peace. I am Decano Wood, and the five nation Confederate lords, I plant the tree of the great peace. I name the tree the tree of the great long leaves. Under the shade of this tree of the great peace, we spread the soft white feathery down of the globe thistle as seats for you, Adoniriah and your cousin lords. We place you upon these seats, spread soft with the feathery down of the globe thistle, there beneath the shade of the spreading branches of the tree of peace. There shall you sit and watch the council fire of the confederacy of the five nations, and all the affairs of the five nations shall be transacted at this place before you. Roots have spread out from the tree of the great priest, one to the north, one to the east, one to the south, and one to the west. The names of these roots is the great white roots, and their nature is peace and strength. If any man or any nation outside the five nations so obey the laws of the great peace and make known their disposition to the lords of the confederacy, they may trace the roots to their tree, and if their minds are clean and they are obedient and promise to obey the wishes of the confederate council, they shall be welcome to take shelter beneath the tree of the long leaves. We place at the top of the tree of the long leaves an eagle who is able to see afar. If he sees in the distance any evil approaching or any danger threatening, he will at once warm the people of the Confederacy. The smoke of the Confederate council fire shall ever ascend and pierce the sky so that other nations who may be allies may see the council fire of the great peace. You know, I want to point out, and, and I don't know if this is interesting for English students, but it's very interesting to the history nerds among us that, <laughs> uh, you know, the organic metaphor um, is not original to any one people group. You know, making metaphors of nature, that's used by a lot of traditional societies. And that is not what is distinctive here, although it is really beautiful and symbolic. But the Iroquois Confederation in its second provision contains a different and a really outstanding, remarkable idea stating that individuals and nations outside the Confederation can trace their roots to the great tree and thereby come under the shelter of the Confederation. You know, not by joining the culture, but by making a promise to really obey the wishes of uh, the Confederate Council. And, you know, this is explicitly political language, and it moves this document from a shared myth to a constitution that allows for future members to join sheerly on political grounds, not even cultural grounds. And that's a huge shift. And it's actually kind of exciting, really. But what we see here is a blend of traditional pre-political structures with political institutions like we're accustomed to today. I mean, it really is amazing. In other words, what you're saying is you could be of a different people group and keep your own culture but still be a member without converting to the majority culture. That's it exactly. And that is a confederation by definition or experience there. And of course, what we have in the United States today, you know, we have that we have hundreds of cultures attempting to live together with a political agreement and not requiring any group to convert to a different culture. And it's a difficult thing to manage. Um, you know, along those lines, let's read Dagana Wood's last message. I mean, it's dated by most scholars to be around 1450 A.D. We bind ourselves together, said Dagana Witta, by taking hold of each other's hands. Our strength shall be in union, our way the way of reason, righteousness, and peace. Hearken, O chiefs, that peace may continue unto future days. Have courage. 
Think not so much of present advantage as the future welfare of the people. When you administer the law, your skins must be seven thumbs thick, so the envious darts of your enemies may not penetrate. Be of strong mind, O chiefs. Carry no anger. Think not, think not forever of yourselves, nor of your own generation. Think of those yet unborn, those whose faces are coming from beneath the ground. Wow. The language is optimistic and future-looking. <laughs> Look at the dates, though. Obviously, the document worked. Even if you line this document up next to colonial history, it our American history didn't even begin until 1776, if you're going to say that it started with the Continental Congress. So, Gary, getting back to the controversy, is there any agreement at all as to the question of whether the founding fathers of our American Constitution, as we call them, studied the Iroquois Constitution and used it to form as the basis of the American one? I mean, I can see that we have representatives, although, you know, we don't have sachems. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, there's not total agreement. Uh, you have to remember, and this, of course, is where the history of indigenous people gets very sad, that by the time of the American Revolution, much of the Iroquois population um, had been decimated by smallpox and chickenpox. And the Iroquois nations suffered really horrible epidemics starting from the 1630s. And wow. if we just look at one example, like over 60 percent of the Mohawk population alone died in the first smallpox epidemic in 1634. And because of this, uh, the numbers of indigenous peoples were so reduced that by the colonial era, you know, compared to the numbers of the British and the French settlers, the native peoples were really in the minority. But what's important is that they were put in this awkward position of trying to navigate neutrality between the European warring opponents. In other words, they had to take sides. And who were they going to support? The French, the British, the Americans? And that's a story within itself that's fascinating. But to get to the question at hand, we know for sure that Benjamin Franklin was a student of indigenous life, and he spent time with the Iroquois leadership, and um, he was a, an admirer of Chief Conestego, the most prominent of the Iroquois leaders during Franklin's lifetime. We also know that another Iroquois leader by the name of Hendrick was asked to provide insight for the colonists as to how um, the Confederation of the Iroquois was structured. This was in reference basically to the Albany Plan of Union, which was one plan presented for consideration in uniting the colonies. And uh, we also know for a fact that in May and in June of 1776, 21 Iroquois leaders visited Philadelphia uh, to meet with the Continental Congress. And this was right before, of course, the Declaration of Independence. And that's what we know for sure at this point. Um, you know, people like James Madison in particular never gave direct credit to any indigenous documents, but there is no doubt that the founders were aware of indigenous confederations and, and how they were structured. And, you know, not just the Iroquois, um, actually there were others, but they were aware that the indigenous peoples were using some form of central government with limited powers to live together in uh, peaceful arrangements on the continent. And uh, we also uh, have been given a few hints that the Haudenosaunee left an impact on our American heritage through some of our most important American symbols. The first, of course, being the most iconic of all American symbols, the eagle. Yeah, you know, I read that about the eagle, and that is really cool. This summer, as a family, we went to Dollywood. That's a, an amusement park, Dolly Parton, built here in the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee. But anyway... In Dollywood, they have bald eagles, and we got to see them because they have them there at the park, and they really are truly incredible birds. One of the things I love about bald eagles that is a uniqueness that I really didn't know before was that it, they are kind of indigenous to this continent. A thing that I didn't know about bald eagles before I started reading up on this podcast, though, that that was the bird chosen by the Iroquois to fly above that tree of peace. 
The eagle, of course, is known for its amazing eyesight, and this characteristic was important for the Iroquois. The idea being that the Iroquois government could be protective and watchful, long-sighted for its people, just like the eagle. Well, I want to make a quick reference to your historical crush, Benjamin Franklin. (laughs) Yes, I do have a historical crush. And go on record that he did not want the American eagle to be our national symbol. He favored the turkey. He thought the turkey was a more noble character. Well, we eat that on Thanksgiving, so that clearly (laughs) had to go. (laughs) Well, and of course, you know, the the eagle isn't the only symbol used in American iconography. Uh, Dagana Witta very famously took an arrow and broke it. He then took two arrows and broke them, but then he bound together five arrows together and illustrated that five arrows could not be broken. And the cluster of the arrows was to symbolize the uh, the strength founding uh, in the joining of these several nations. And Hendrick illustrated this for the colonists. And one of the delegates is recorded to have said this, Hendrick used the example of the Iroquois when their nations came together. He held up one arrow and broke it, Then he held up five arrows bound together and showed how they could not be broken. And really, if you look at the symbol of the United States, in the left talon of the American eagle, you will see 13 arrows held by an eagle. And, you know, I've seen that so many times, and I have never one time thought about it until we read this about the origin of it. Yes, and let me give you one other interesting historical fact. We have 50 states in this union 26 of those states are named after a Native American Indian tribe or Native American words. Something else I didn't even think about. That's how deep the indigenous history runs in the United States. Well, it's very cool. And just like a soaring eagle, we threw that story probably faster than we should have. (laughs) And threw in a pun. I know. Well, the story of the peacemaker of Hiawatha and Haudenosaunee is of course, more intricate than the quick discussion that we just had. And there's lots of wisdom and the many myths and legends, and we would do well to think about them at great length. And I know you knew this, but I had never thought about that expression, burying the hatchet. And I never knew that it came from an indigenous document. And I did not know that it came from this indigenous document. I didn't know that it had anything to do with Hiawatha's ability to offer forgiveness and to forge a confederacy that would be the basis for one of the oldest working forms of democracy on planet Earth. It's an incredible legacy, and it goes to show, if nothing else, and of course this is what Whitman kept saying over and over again his entire life, that we are way more alike than we are different. And if we look closely, we will see our paths have intertwined way more than if we could have ever imagined. And if we choose, even the most divided and hurt among us can bury those hatchets and forge a future towards peace. And that is a reason to celebrate Friendsgiving at any time of year. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Well, we hope you enjoyed listening to this very abbreviated discussion of an incredible document from our continent and this excerpt from the Iroquois Constitution. Uh, We also hope, if you enjoy the discussion, that you will share about us uh, to your friends and your colleagues. Give us a five-star rating on your podcast app and post uh, an episode on social media and follow us on any of our social media platforms you know the usual suspects instagram facebook twitter linkedin all that also don't forget to check out our teaching materials on how to love lit podcast.com peace out